Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Young, and I'll be presenting the key outcomes of the terrestrial ecosystem studies of the Beedaloo Shreba. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which the Beedaloo Shreba studies were undertaken and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Firstly, I'll outline the scope and the context of the terrestrial ecosystem study. So the scope of works set out the objectives for the terrestrial ecosystem studies, which encompass both terrestrial flora and terrestrial fauna, and aim to address ecological communities, including riparian communities specifically, terrestrial vascular plant species, terrestrial vertebrate species, terrestrial invertebrate species, particularly ants, threatened species and their habitats, and other matters protected by legislation, and other target species or groups and their habitats. Just a note that weeds were recorded, but they were not, accept, not assessed, as these are assessed through the Code of Practice and Associated Weed Management Planning Guide. The outputs outlined by the scope of works determined that the main outputs from the terrestrial ecosystem studies were vegetation map of the study area, description of the regional biogeographic patterns for flora and fauna, spatial distribution models for significant species, identification and mapping of areas of high conservation value, evaluation of the sensitivity of significant species to development and suitable indicators and methods for regional monitoring. And just to note that data from collected during Shreba surveys was supplemented with data collected during the Beedaloo Geological and Bioregional Assessment Program undertaken in 2020. So this map shows the study area, which spans an area from approximately Mataranka in the north to south of Elliot in the south. The study area itself is shown by the black dashed line and was defined by the spatial distribution of terrestrial ecological values on which gas development could feasibly have a direct or indirect impact. The delineation of this boundary considered the geological subbasin boundaries delimiting the gas resource shown in the solid blue line on the map. The biogeographic boundaries, pre predominantly the boundaries of the Newcastle and Burdum subregions of the Sturt Plateau bioregion, which are shown in the light and dark green polygons on this map. Also incorporated into the study area are smaller areas of the Daly Basin region, Gulf Fall and Uplands region, Mitchell Grass Downs region, Tanami region, and the Davenport Murchison Ranges region. Catchment boundaries were also accounted for in the delineation of the study area, most notably with the inclusion of Lake Woods and the Newcastle Creek catchment in the southwest of the study area. Also incorporates areas of the Roper River, Wiser Region, Barclay Region, Limon Bight River, and Daly River catchments. The most notable drainage system in the south of the study area, as I said before, is the Newcastle Creek catchment. Whereas most of the northern study area is within the southern catchments of the Roper River. Surface drainage across the study area is mostly weakly developed and ephemeral. However, there are perennial flows in the Roper River and persistent water holes across the study area. The distribution of GDEs is concentrated in the northwest and the southeast of the study area, and are most, most notably springs, shown by the aqua circles on this map and riparian ecosystems, which are shown by the dark blue lines. The study area delineation was also, um, also defined to provide sufficient geographic extent so that um, there was adequate regional context to assess the significance of ecological values and potential risks from onshore gas development. The study area spans the hot semi-arid seasonal tropical zone between the arid zone in the south and the seasonal tropical savanna in the north. Average annual rainfall varies across the study area from approximately 500 millimetres in the south to approximately 1,000 millimetres in the north with distinct wet and dry seasons. The wet season generally falls over the hotter, more humid months between December and March. During the study, uh, the year spanning June 2020 to May 2021, uh, saw greater, average, greater than average rainfall in the north and central portions of the study area, but lower than average rainfall in the south. Whereas in June 2021 to May 2022, 
there was lower than average rainfall across the study area. And this influences what um, biodiversity can be recorded across the study area during that time. The majority of the study area has been burnt at least once within the last 10 years, but fire history is highly variable and areas of high fire frequency typically coincide with specific properties or tenure types. In general, pastoral leases experience less frequent fires than other tenure types and have more land that has remained unburnt for the last 10 or more years. Areas that experience higher fire frequency are typically burnt later in the dry season. There are some areas within the study region that have already been identified as being of high conservation value. This includes the Mataranka Thermal Pools and Surrounds, which are encompassed by the Mataranka Thermal Pools Site of Conservation Significance in Elsie National Park, and is also listed as a nationally important wetland. And this area occurs in the north of the study area near Mataranka. Lakewoods and Longreach Waterhole in the south of the study area are encompassed by the Lakewood Site of Conservation Significance, Longreach Waterhole Conservation Reserve, Lakewood's Conservation Covenant, and Lakewood's, the status of Lakewood's as a nationally important wetland. Bullwaddy Conservation Reserve is also within the study area and protects a small area of the anti-endemic Bullwaddy vegetation type. I'll move on now to discussing the key outputs of the terrestrial flora and vegetation component of this study. The terrestrial flora and vegetation component sought to comprehensively document the regional flora, define vegetation communities and create a regional vegetation map, evaluate the attributes and environmental relationships of the vegetation types, assess the occurrence and distribution of significant species and vegetation, and identify vegetation related biodiversity values across the study area. Vegetation data collection was undertaken using four approaches, which were full floristic sampling, dominant species plots, rapid height assessments, and compiled legacy data. In each case, the methods used were standard for vegetation site data collection in the Northern Territory. Full floristic sampling includes recording all detectable plants, vegetation structure, and environmental covariates such as landform soils and disturbance in a 50 by 50 metre plot. Full floristic sampling was undertaken during 2021 and 2022 at 659 sites for the Schreiber project. Full floristic sampling was also undertaken at 47 sites during the GBA project in 2020. These surveys provide data on the composition and condition of vegetation communities across the region. Full floristic sites were stratified to obtain representative samples of each vegetation community identified by preliminary vegetation mapping undertaken during the GBA project. Regional variation was accounted for by repeated sampling of vegetation communities across each of the five 100 millimeter rainfall ISA heights, the subbasin, and the broader study area. Data useful for defining vegetation communities and refining and validating the vegetation map were collected at dominant species plots and rapid assessment sites. As these sampling methods are more efficient than full floristic in inventory plots. They allow for the generation of a much greater volume of data and contributed greatly towards the community definition and map refinement. Legacy data in the department's vegetation site database was also extracted and where deemed suitable, it was also used and contributed towards the classification and validation of the vegetation map. Combining the legacy data and data collected in 2020 with the Schreiber data, there were just over 12,000 data points across the study area that were used for environmental mapping, and the 706 full floristic plots that were used for detailed community analysis. The combination of cluster analysis and expert knowledge was used to refine the vegetation community typology for the study area and to define broad vegetation groups for mapping. A vegetation map of these broad vegetation groups was then created using object-based image analysis, whereby Segmentation of a ecological, ecologically relevant satellite data was used to delineate the boundaries of features in the landscape and vegetation community attributes collecting during field surveys were then assigned to the segmentation output to train and validate the classification model. Further detail of these methods can be found in chapter three of the final report. The Shreba studies added over 15,000 new plant records to the study area, 
which represents a 28% increase on the previous total. Over 1,800 species are now known to occur in the study area, which is about 30% of all known taxa to occur in the NT. The number of plant records within the geological subbasin increased by 43% following the Shreba surveys, and currently almost 1,100 taxa are known from within the subbasin. This is approximately 18% of all known NT flora taxa. The cluster analysis identified groups of related sites. Using these statistically defined groupings and the preliminary vegetation typology, botanical experts defined a final typology of 51 vegetation communities. These vegetation communities were then aggregated into 21 broad vegetation groups deemed to be most suitable for mapping across the study area. The 21 broad vegetation groups are shown on this slide and the descriptions of these and the 51 vegetation communities can be found in Appendix E to the Flora chapter of the Terrestrial Ecosystems Report. The regional vegetation map was a key output for the Terrestrial Ecosystem Study and shows the broad vegetation groups at a 1 to 100,000 scale and small distinct features such as riparian areas, swamps and wetlands at a finer 1 to 25,000 scale. The map provides a baseline layer for the vegetation within the study area at a scale appropriate for environmental assessment and management, and from which a cumulative impact assessment can occur. It also identifies the location of sensitive and significant ecosystems, places habitats and ecosystems described at a local scale into a broader and more regional context. The regional ecosystem map shows the extent of the broad vegetation groups across the study area. The five broad vegetation groups that are typical Corimbia woodland communities associated with sandy loams of deeply weathered laterite make up the greatest proportion of the study area. The Corimbia eucalyptus open woodland on sandy loam vegetation group is the most extensive and covers about a third of the study area. Seven broad vegetation groups are associated with drainage, riparian areas, wetlands and springs. These broad vegetation types are limited in extent in the study area, particularly the riparian, melaleuca forest, monsoon forest and thicket, ephemeral wetland and lignum swamp groups. Should be noted that the monsoon forest and thicket vegetation type was not included in the mapping due to a lack of field survey data for training. Three broad vegetation groups are associated with indurated surfaces and laterite dura crusts. The Lancewood and Bullwaddy communities cover approximately 14% of the study area and form a band through the mid to the south of the study area, but occur less commonly in the north. The Snappy Gum communities are associated with sandstone on the edges of the study area and some smaller patches within the Sturt Plateau. Five broad vegetation groups are associated with clay plains and include the vegetation communities typical of black soil plains. Extensive clay plains of Coolabar low open woodland and tussock grasslands dominate the lower elevation portions of the study area, particularly in the southern region. One broad vegetation group, the Corimbia and Eucalyptus woodland on sandstone group, is associated with sandstone outcrops and ranges, and one group, the Acacia shrubland and hummock grassland on sand plains group, is associated with sand plains, particularly in the southwest of the study area. These vegetation communities occur largely outside of the subbasin boundaries. The regional vegetation map is available online as a downloadable spatial layer and information in the Terrestrial Ecosystems Report provides further explanation of the process, caveats and limitations associated with the map and its interpretation. Data collected during full floristic plot surveys was also analysed to evaluate the floristic attributes and environmental relationships of each broad vegetation group. Generalised linear modelling was used to analyse the structural and floristic attributes of the broad vegetation groups, whereas distance-based redundancy analysis was used to understand the relationships between flora species composition and environmental variables such as soil type, rainfall and fire. Structurally, four broad vegetation groups, including Malaluka Forest, Lancewood Forest, Corimbia Bella Woodland and Bullwaddy, had higher upper story cover relative to other vegetation groups. Melaleuca forest and Corimbia Bella woodland were also tall relative to other vegetation groups and had higher mid story cover. The woodland in Runon, Bohinia and Corimbia woodland, Riparian woodland, Bullwaddy, Lancewood, and Acacia shrubland groups also had relatively high mid story cover. Ground story cover was high in the tussock grasslands and Melaleuca low open woodland. Floristically, 
four broad vegetation groups supported an average of over 20 native species and six broad vegetation groups supported over 25 tropical allied species, with the highest richness for both of these groups being found in riparian woodland vegetation. Seven broad vegetation groups supported an average of over six rainforest allied species, with the highest richness being found in bullwaddy shrubland and woodland. Four broad vegetation groups supported an average of over 15 arid allied species, with the highest richness being found in Bohinia and Carimbia woodland. 111 introduced flora species were recorded during surveys, with a greater number of introduced species occurring in vegetation types associated with riparian, drainage and run-on areas, as shown in this graph. 32 of these introduced species are declared as weeds under the Weed Management Act. Disturbance by cattle was the predominant disturbance recorded across the study area, and it was most extensive and intense within ephemeral wetlands, and equally intense but less extensive in riparian communities. The composition of flora species across the study area was described mostly by lithology, surface rock and gravel cover, annual rainfall and soil clay content. This table shows how the vegetation in the study area separates into groups that occur on soils with higher sand content compared to those that occur on soils with higher clay content. Within these soil types, vegetation types also separate into groups that are predominantly related to the high, moderate or low parts of the rainfall gradient, which are also related to fire frequency. Although no threatened species were identified as occurring in the study area prior to the Beedaloo Shreva, two threatened flora species were recorded during field surveys. Eleocaris retroflexa is listed as vulnerable under the Federal Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act and occurs in the very north of the study area. Carex fasticularis is listed as vulnerable under the Territory Parks and Wildlife Act and occurs in, to the south of the study area. There are not enough data for either species to undertake species distribution modelling. In addition to the two threatened species, 22 near threatened species and 83 data deficient species as listed under the Territory Parks and Wildlife Act were recorded during field surveys. Four restricted range species were also identified. These species have disjunct distributions or are habitat specialists within isolated habitat patches. No species were assessed as being endemic or only occurring in the study area. All of the results from the terrestrial flora and vegetation component of this study allowed for the identification of flora and vegetation values within the study area. Flora and vegetation values were identified as being sensitive or significant or subject to protective measures under the Northern Territory Land Clearing Guidelines, groundwater dependent ecosystems, communities with relatively high values observed for elements of biodiversity, or more extensive ecosystems that are endemic to the Northern Territory. Five broad vegetation groups were identified as having high ecological value, including groundwater dependent and non groundwater dependent ecosystems. High value groundwater dependent vegetation types include riparian woodland, melaleuca forests, and monsoon forest and thicket. There are concentrations of groundwater dependent vegetation types in the north of the study area near Mataranka and associated with the sandstone ranges and escarpments on the eastern margin of the study area where the Sturt Plateau and Gulf Fall and upland bioregions meet. Ephemerally inundated riparian woodlands are particularly important in the south of the study area where rainfall and therefore water availability is lower. High value vegetation types that are not thought to rely on groundwater include ephemeral wetlands and lignum shrubland. These are highly restricted in extent and they're wetlands that support a high number of significant species. High value communities are very limited in extent in the study area and they occupy less than 1% of the landscape. Therefore, as well as being high value, they are also potentially sensitive to disturbance from onshore gas development. Moving on to the fauna component of the terrestrial ecosystem study, which included understanding the biogeographic patterns of fauna across the study area. The aims of this component of the terrestrial fauna work were to document vertebrate and selected invertebrate fauna of the study area, test the ability of major habitat categories to summarise fauna patterns, describe finer scale drivers of faunal assemblages and identify habitats of high biodiversity value. Specifically, this work focused on birds, reptiles, non-volant or non-flying mammals, bats and ants. Fauna inventory surveys were undertaken at 98 sites across 20 properties in the study area in 2021 and 2022. An additional 15 sites, where just the camera method was used, were undertaken at 15 sites for the GBA project in 2020. 
Sites were stratified across the 11 major habitats identified in the study area and regional representation. These habitat types was achieved by placing sites across all rainfall isoheights in which habitats occurred. There were a minimum of five sites in each habitat type and sites were a minimum of two kilometres apart, except where restricted habitats could only be found in closer proximity. All sites were adjacent to vehicle tracks for accessibility purposes. Live trapping using Elliott cage, funnel and pitfall traps was undertaken at each site, along with invertebrate sampling, bird surveys, nocturnal searches, camera trapping and passive bat detectors in order to detect a broad range of fauna species and groups. Fauna inventory sites coincided with the subset of the full floristic sites discussed earlier. Therefore, flora and vegetation information were available. Additional habitat characteristics were also recorded during fauna surveys, including ground cover, log abundance, litter depth and composition, and the number of visible tree hollows at a site. In order to document the fauna of the study area, species lists from the GBA and Shriva surveys were compiled along with species previously recorded and published in the Northern Territory Fauna Atlas. Generalised linear models were used to analyse patterns in the number and abundance of species in relation to major habitat categories and environmental drivers, and distance-based linear modelling was used to analyse patterns in species composition. Data were analysed separately for the main faunal groups, which included birds, reptiles, non-volant mammals, ants and microbats. The results of these analysis, analyses were then used to identify habitats of high biodiversity value. Overall, 353 vertebrate fauna species were recorded during the GBA and Schreiber surveys, including 14 amphibians, 202 birds, 39 mammals and 99 reptiles. Including fauna atlas records, 512 vertebrate fauna species are now known from the study area. Additionally, 691 target invertebrate taxa were recorded during Schreiber surveys, including 639 ants, 17 weevils and 35 wingless wasps. Of note is that just 39 ant taxa, three weevils and few wingless wasp taxa could be identified to species, indicating a high level of undescribed diversity for these groups within the study area. Also of particular note is the diversity of the ant fauna in the Beetaloo region, which is very high by global standards, but likely typical of similarly sized regions throughout monsoonal Australia. Rather than describe the following results for each target fauna group in detail, I'll present the key results for each. For each group, we looked for differences in the number of species between habitats and in other environmental drivers, such as landform and soil type, as well as at the frequency of each group as a surrogate for abundance, and species composition, which tells us how the identity of species within assemblages varies. Firstly, birds. There were a higher number of bird species at mid rainfall values, as shown in the top graph, and in the stream and swamp landforms, as sh shown in the bottom graph. Similar patterns were seen for the frequency of birds across the study area. Bird species composition varied across the rainfall gradient from the arid south to the more tropical north. Species composition in the black soil plain landform was different to other landform classes, particularly in the unwooded black soil plains. Interestingly, species composition within the streams in the south of the study area was more similar to northern landforms than southern landforms, indicating that these habitats facilitate the penetration of tropical species into more arid areas. The abundance of visible tree hollows and vegetation stru structure were finer scale drivers of bird species composition. As seen for birds, there was a higher number of reptile species at mid rainfall values as shown in the top graph. However, the frequency of reptiles increased with increasing annual rainfall in a linear fashion. There was also a higher number and frequency of reptile species in sandier soils and soils with higher clay content as shown in the bottom graph. Reptile species composition also varied in relation to rainfall and soil type. Reptile species composition was particularly different in the more arid and more tropical parts of the study area compared to the mid-rainfall isoheights. Within soil types, reptile species composition was different in clay soils compared to those with higher sand content. The number and frequency of non-volant mammal species was also highest at mid-rainfall values. Additionally, the number of mammal species was higher where the frequency of rock and litter depths were lower. The frequency of mammals was higher in the black soil plain, drainage depression, plain and swamp landforms, but there was high variation within these landform classes. The frequency of mammals was also higher where litter depth was lower. Mammal species composition varied across the rainfall gradient and was more similar between neighbouring rainfall isoheights. Composition also varied by soil type, especially between the sandy and clay soils. The black soil plain and hill landforms had the most different composition of mammal species compared to each other and all other landform classes.
the relationship between the number of ant taxa and rainfall was the inverse of that seen for other faunal groups, whereby the number of taxa was lower at mid-rainfall values as shown in the top graph. Interestingly, rainfall became unimportant for ant abundance, where environmental attributes were included in analyses. Both the number of ant taxa and the abundance of ants was higher in sandy soils, as shown in the bottom graph, and the number of ant taxa was also higher in the plain landform. As for reptiles, ant taxa composition differed across the rainfall gradient, and particularly in the more arid and more tropical parts of the study area compared to the mid-rainfall isohytes. Ant taxa composition in the hill landform differed from all other landforms. For all other landforms, there is an indication that ant taxa composition changed from the more well-drained landforms such as rocky flats and plains to less well-drained landforms such as streams, swamps and black soil plains. This also coincided with differences in ant taxa composition between soils with higher clay content and those with higher sand content. As there were a low number of detections of microbat species, drivers of the number of microbat species and the occurrence of individual species were analysed. The only variable that related well to the number of microbat species was average annual rainfall, whereby there were a higher number of species at higher rainfall values as shown by this graph. There were also species-specific responses in occurrence relating to overstory height and cover, hollow abundance, fire frequency, rainfall, and rock fr frequency. The analyses of the biogeographic patterns of fauna identified habitats and habitat attributes of value. Riparian zones, ephemeral swamps, and Lofostomum woodlands are important for bird diversity, particularly in the south of the study area. Hollows and large trees are also important for fauna. The tallest trees were recorded in run-on woodlands and hollows were most abundant in Bullwaddy woodland, Lofostomum woodland, riparian woodland and woodland on rocky flat. It is useful to note that the abundance of hollows of certain sizes varied between these habitats and that different sized hollows represent habitat for different species. In terms of disturbance, it was found that introduced herbivore activity was highest in riparian woodland, Lofostomum woodland and woodland on black soil plain and predator activity was highest in Melaleuca woodland and riparian woodland, which affects the suitability of habitat for fauna species. The terrestrial fauna component of this study also looked at significant fauna species and water birds, which I'll move on to now. Targeted surveys were undertaken for five threatened species, including the crested trike tit, Gordian finch, greater bilby, ghost bat, and plains death adder. Targeted surveys were also undertaken for water birds as this group was identified as being potentially sensitive to disturbance from onshore gas development. Other threatened fauna species were identified as occurring or potentially occurring in the study area. However, it was considered that these species were either already covered under other survey methods or that targeted survey was impractical due to the species cryptic nature or unpredictable and irregular occurrence. The crested trike tit was targeted using call playback surveys at 109 sites and the Gordian finch was targeted using waterhole counts at 26 sites across the study area during the GBA and Treba projects. Surveys for the Greater Bilby were also undertaken during the GBA and Treba projects. This included 39 on-ground track plot surveys and over 2,000 kilometres of aerial transect in the southwest of the study area. The ghost bat was targeted using call playback with video cameras at 30 sites close to limestone outcropping in the north of the study area. The Plains Death Adder was targeted during nocturnal road transects in grassland habitat in the south of the study area. Waterbirds were surveyed using a combination of aerial and on-ground surveys of 55 water bodies with standing water during both the late dry and late wet seasons to account for seasonal differences in surface water availability. Not all waterbird sites were surveyed during both seasons or with both methods. The distributions of the crested trike tick, Gordian finch, greater bilby and yellow spotted monitor were analysed using Maxent modelling, which uses presence only records to predict the occurrence of species across the landscape in relation to environmental predictors. As Maxent uses just presence locations of species, we could incorporate records from the fauna atlas as well as records collected during on-ground surveys. Data for the ghost bat and plains death adder were not adequate enough for modelling, but existing spatial data relating to their known habitats are presented. For water birds, we used generalised linear models to assess the drivers of species richness and abundance and distance-based redundancy analysis to understand the drivers of water bird species composition. 37 new records of the crested trike tit were collected during the GBA and Schreiber projects, with the majority of these occurring during targeted call playback surveys. The Gordian finch was detected at 52 locations, with the majority of these being incidental observations outside of formal surveys. Ghost bats were recorded at 14 targeted survey sites. 
25 new locations of the Greater Bilby recorded were recorded during aerial surveys, but the species was not detected during any on-ground surveys. The plane's death adder wasn't recorded during any surveys. Five other threatened species were recorded in the study area in addition to the threatened species that were targeted. These include the Australian painted snipe, grey falcon, red gossel, common brush tail possum and Merton's water monitor. Ten bird, eight mammal and two reptile species that are listed as near threatened in the Northern Territory were also recorded during this study. This increased the known extent of occurrence for two of these species, which were the Carpentarian Sud Sudanicinus and the Eastern subspecies of the Purple Crown Fairy Wren. One bird and two reptile species listed as data deficient in the Northern Territory were also recorded during surveys. For each of the model threatened species, distribution maps were made based on the top performing models. These maps show the predicted mean probability of occurrence for each species across the study area. Maps of the standard deviation of the probability of occurrence are also presented in the report for each species to provide an estimate of the uncertainty of each model. These maps provide an estimate of where the highest value habitat for the, these threatened species is more likely to occur and will help to target further survey effort and planning in relation to onshore gas development. For the ghost bat and the plains death adder, existing mapping of habitat provides some information about where these species are more likely to occur. The ghost bat roosts in limestone outcrops, which corresponds to the mapped extent of Tyndall limestone in the study area. The plains death adder inhabits treeless grasslands on cracking clay soils, which corresponds to the tussock grass and broad vegetation group map during the flora component discussed earlier. You can see the mapped extent of Tyndall limestone on the left and the mapped extent of tussock grassland on the right. This mapping indicates where high value habitat for these two species may occur and should be used to plan further survey work. Now onto water birds. The number of water bird species and the abundance of different water bird functional groups were variously related to surface water persistence, bank vegetation cover, annual rainfall, surface water catchment, the presence of islands in the wetland, livestock fencing, cattle disturbance and wetland type. Water bird species composition varied predominantly by surface water catchment and also by latitude, wetland size and type, and surface water persistence. Importantly, water bird species composition was also different between the wet season and the dry season. Important sites for water birds were also identified during this study. Drought and dry season refuges were identified as those where surface water persisted longer in the landscape and indicates where high value habitat facilitating the persistence of water birds in the study area occurs. When Lake Quids is in flood, it represents an important water bird breeding site, as do the water holes on Newcastle Creek. These sites support some of the largest breeding colonies of water birds in the Northern Territory. Lake Quids also supports large congregations of water birds when it is in flood. The Australian painted snipe and curlew sandpaper are both threatened species known from the study area. There are also 18 migratory water bird species listed under international conventions known from the study area. The magpie goose is a managed species under the Territory Parks and Wildlife Act to allow for its sustainable use and was recorded during Treba surveys and is also known previously from the study area. The results of the flora and fauna components of the terrestrial ecosystem study allowed for the identification of biodiversity values within the study area, the identification of key risks associated with onshore gas development and recommendations for monitoring. As discussed at the start of this presentation, the Mariranka Thermal Pools and Surrounds and Lake Woods and Longreach Water Hole are known to be sites of high value, and the results of the study support this. In addition to previously identified high value sites, we identified 10 broad vegetation groups that were determined to be sensitive and significant in relation to onshore gas development. These include five vegetation groups that are considered to be of high value and five groups considered to be of moderate value. Significant and sensitive species and groups were water birds and threatened species. For water birds, isolated wetlands with persistent surface water, particularly in the Newcastle Creek system and on the Sturt Plateau, were identified as being of high value, as was lake woods and waterholes close to lake woods. Of the threatened fauna species identified as being potentially impacted by onshore gas development, predictive habitat mapping was undertaken for the Crested Triactic, Gordian Finch and Greater Bilby. This mapping highlights where there is a higher likelihood of high value habitat occurring for these species. The ghost bat, Australian painted snipe and common brush tail possum were also identified as being sensitive and significant species, as were two threatened flora species recorded during surveys. Predictive mapping wasn't undertaken for these species. However, information on the habitat association of these species exists and can be used to inform further survey work. 
Major risks associated with onshore gas development were comprehensively assessed by CSIRO for the Beetaloo GBA region. The study, the Schreiber study provided support for eight main potential risks, including habitat degradation, fragmentation and loss, inappropriate fire regimes, reduction in surface water and groundwater availability, surface water and groundwater contamination, soil contamination, erosion and sedimentation, competition and predation, invasive plants and mortality of native species. Some of these threats are already present in the landscape but could be further exacerbated by onshore gas development. However, others such as reduction in surface water and groundwater availability are more specific to onshore gas development and may interact with existing threats. Based on the values just outlined, we identified five main areas where monitoring would be effective and feasible. Monitoring of the spatial extent of valuable vegetation types can be effectively done through remote sensing. This can include the monitoring of surface water in conjunction with site-based monitoring of surface water dependent ecosystems, and can also include monitoring of the directional change in canopy cover. Landscape monitoring of vegetation clearing, fragment, clearing and fragmentation can also be undertaken using remote sensing techniques including the monitoring of sensitive vegetation types, the retention of native vegetation buffers around waterways, drainage areas and wetlands, and the retention of native vegetation wildlife corridors. Time series, mo time series monitoring of fire scars from satellite imagery can include metrics of the amount of area burnt, season and frequency of fire, assessment of long unburnt areas, and the patchiness of fire. Because water bird species occurrence and abundance in the study area fluctuates seasonally and in relation to natural climatic variation. Monitoring of water bird species isn't likely to provide enough data to detect changes that can be directly attributed to impacts from onshore gas development. However, water bird habitat quality can be monitored in addition to a subset of aquatic fauna at a set of regionally important wetlands to provide an indicator of the quality of habitat for water birds. Birds are the most amenable of the vertebrate group fauna groups to monitoring. However, monitoring of the bird fauna across the entire study area or subbasin is unlikely to be feasible or informative. Instead, monitoring of the bird fauna of riparian and swamp systems is recommended as these habitats were identified as being of high value for birds in the study area, are restricted in the landscape and are sensitive to the impacts of onshore gas development. This presentation gives an overview of the key results of the terrestrial ecosystem study of the Beetaloo Schreiber. More detail on the work undertaken in this study can be found in the full report on the Schreiber data portal. To finish, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we worked and those who we worked with directly. I would also like to acknowledge the property owners and managers who provided access to land and who provided us with useful information about their properties and the region. Field survey teams, including 30 scientists, put in a huge amount of effort to collect and analyse the data, and researchers from Charles Darwin University identified all invertebrate specimens collected during field surveys. Finally, there was a big support team that provided assistance with the engagement and logistics needed for the study to run smoothly. Thank you.